Welcome to Replenish Hope. I am your host, Denise Castro. Hi, welcome to Replenish Hope, and we are here once again. We hope that you are doing well today. Today, I have a friend who is going to share her story, how she has found hope, and how she has also encourage others through her friendships and her family and even people at work to find hope in, well, how, how would you say that? Hope in recovery? Yeah, I guess just um, acceptance. Acceptance. Acceptance and recovery, for sure. It's, it's a journey that started when, my friend? So for me, it started as a child, as young as probably four is probably my earliest mem- memory of it, mm-hmm. um, of when I when I realized mental illness was part of my family. <coughs> mm-hmm. So for can you explain a little bit that moment or? Okay, so obviously when you're a kid, you don't understand everything going on. You know, you see things, but you don't know exactly and parents don't tell you everything, but um, I have a parent who is diagnosed bipolar. Um, So at an early age, I started dealing with um, or experiencing with my, with my parent, um, dealing with episodes as they call them, Mm -hmm. our breakdowns, and even at sometimes um, hospitalizations for that. Mm -hmm. So um, that was an experience that I experienced throughout my childhood on and off. Um, And then even as a teenager, I ended up having a sibling who was diagnosed with the same, with the same bipolar disorder Mm -hmm. as my parent. So you saw in a very young age, did you, but you also had a very beautiful uh, family and experience as well. Yeah, I would, I would definitely describe my childhood as a good childhood. Mm -hmm. There was definitely traumatic moments, um, which I don't think I realized until later um, were were traumatic, I guess. Mm-hmm. I guess, you know, once we got through them, um, you know, things such as like my parent being taken away um, by the PERT team or the police officers that responded mm-hmm. um, and then hospitalized for <clears throat> um, weeks or months at a time. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, once we got through it, it our childhood kind of went back to normal, and we had a beautiful childhood. We had, we had two supportive parents who always um, provided us with our what we needed and more. We were involved, very involved in sports, and very involved in our church. Mm-hmm. So, we, um, I would definitely describe my childhood as a good childhood, mm-hmm. a beautiful childhood, a blessed childhood, mm-hmm. um, with some traumatic moments. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. You love uh, your family. It's a sports family. Yes. Very active. Mm-hmm. A lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Both. Both. We played sports and we love to watch sports. So we yeah, we are definitely we're very close knit. Mm-hmm. And maybe maybe because maybe our um, experiences, it, you know, kept us close because we were relying on each other for for that strength and that help, that hope and that help. Um, to get each other through the things we went through. Were you, are you the only girl? <laughs> or you have more? S- I have two siblings. Two siblings? Yeah. Okay. Two siblings. I am the baby. You are the youngest one. Yes. I'm the baby. <laughs> with two siblings. Two older siblings. So how was your experience as a child when you started to think, there's something different here with my family. Okay. So my first experience that I remember, and there could have been some before, but the first experience I remember was I was probably around the age four, and I remember um, our neighbors coming over and quickly um, gathering me and my siblings um, to go to their house. And my parents were yelling at each other. Um, I don't remember about what but I remember one parent kind of being out of control and being 
like standing on the couch and pointing at the other mm-hmm. and um, just being very demanding. But I didn't know I, I was only four. <clears throat> mm-hmm. I just remember them yelling and screaming at each other. My neighbor, my neighbors coming and ushering me and my siblings out of the house. We went to their house and they were just trying to keep us distracted. But I do remember I looked out the window. Okay. I saw them carrying my parent. Parent. I saw them carrying my parent into the the like as my my parent is screaming and wailing. I saw them carrying my parent into the 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 cop car, and then drive away. And I had no idea what was going on. Um, that followed by, you know, visitations to see that parent in the hospital, and it it made it. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know. You know, as a four-year-old, you have no idea. Mm-hmm. You're just happy to go that to go see them, and um, and then when they got out, everything kind of went back to normal. Like they, you know, that parent was happy again and seemed normal, and you just kind of went about life until the next episode happened. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, every few. At the time, I want to say, like, every few years, we'd have an episode. And, um, at, you know, the cops would come again, mm-hmm. respond to the residents, wherever we were. And as I got older, you know, then I then I think my, you know, my parents kind of explained to me what was going on and why it was happening and, you know, kind of explained that it was the chemical imbalance and um, <clears throat> why the episodes were happening. So... Um, it was, it was just a lot of, um, inconsistencies, I guess, as a child, cause we'd be like good and then like we'd be bad mm-hmm. <laughs> and then we'd be missing a parent and then the parent that was essentially a single parent for, you know, I think the longest hospitalization was around like 60 days. Mm-hmm. Um, and with three children, that's tough on one parent. Mm-hmm. So I do remember our pastor helping out and um he would we would get dropped off at our pastor's house with his wife Mm -hmm. and then they would take us to school and while our other parent went to work and then you know they'd they'd pick us up from school and then our parent would pick us up and then we'd go visit you know in the hospital until they were released again Mm -hmm. so at some point, though, I want to say when I was about maybe maybe like 10 years old, things got better and stable, and literally no other hospitalization has happened since wow. for that parent. <clears throat> and I think, I think that... Um, the reason behind that is not only God and prayers, but that w- my parent finally realized, like, I think before it was like an inner struggle to really, to believe that they needed to rely on medication for the rest of their life. There was a constant battle, like, no, I think I could do it without the medication. Mm-hmm. So then they'd stop taking the medication, and then these episodes would happen. Would happen. You know, they might be good for a day or two, but, like, the third day without the medication, that's when, like, things started to go really bad. So, you know, after after so many hospitalizations and being away from their children, Mm -hmm. they finally realized, like, what am I doing? You know, like, it's okay. I could could take medication. Like, this is what I'm going to do to be to be better, a better person for my, my children, from, for, you know, my partner, then this is what I'm going to do. Mm-hmm. And so once they came to that realization, you know, they, they, had a, they didn't have a hospitalization again. Fantastic. Yeah. But then, mm-hmm. so then there was, you know, a good few years, no hospitalizations. And then, you know, a few years pass, and I'm probably like 13 now. <clears throat> and... Um, my one one of my siblings starts showing symptoms. Mm-hmm. Um, they're sixteen years old. Wow. Yeah, they started showing symptoms of the bipolar disorder, 
And my parents, it, they knew, I think, but they were, at first, I think they didn't want to believe it. Like, no, mm-hmm. not again, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so then we dealt with, you know, the same situations, the cops being called, um, the print team coming out, and taking taking our my sibling to the hospital to it was basically like the same cycle but now we're going through it with your with, sibling yeah with my sibling so the same thing though i you know although every now and then there's times where my sibling will um go into a funk and almost it's almost good he hit they haven't been hospitalized in quite a while, but but there is there's been moments where it's been close mm-hmm. before they they finally like you know Call. get back on their meds or they they a lot of times what it does it is they they stop taking their medication they stop sleeping and then the two combination just is like a recipe for disaster mm-hmm. so. They'll take, you know, they'll get their prescription meds like that are like basically like a prescribed as needed Mm -hmm. to sleep. And once they get like this really good night's sleep, it's kind of like resets them almost to to. okay wait, (laughs) like almost snaps them back like, what am I doing? Mm -hmm. You take my medication like Mm -hmm. I'm supposed to take my medication Mm -hmm. and then they're like back to normal. But it's still, you know, it's a struggle. It's a struggle for my sibling. I think they haven't come to the realization that my parent did. Like, no, this is it. I'm forever going to do what I need to do. But, yeah. Like, it, that your parent became very disciplined with yes, that. Yes, very much so. And and it was just kind of more of like a an acceptance. Like, like it's okay. Mm-hmm. Like, I think a lot of people struggle with Feeling that they have to rely on a medication mm-hmm. to be stable. Mm-hmm. A lot of people don't want to. They 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 want to to not have to rely on something. Mm-hmm. You know, they want to be able to just not have to take medication or say they're on medication or they're you know. Mm-hmm. So when my parent finally accepted it mm-hmm. and said it's okay, like. I'm going to do this for, you know, the rest of my life, and that's okay. Mm-hmm. Um, that's when their breakthrough happened. <clears throat> and they were able to live, like, an amazing life. You know, they 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 had a career at a very prestigious university, and um, they were able to retire after 20 years working full-time there. Mm-hmm. So they accomplished a lot mm-hmm. after, you know, they finally realized what they they had to do. So I think my sibling just needs to get to that point. And um, I think they're getting there. It's mm-hmm. just a little bit, it's just a little bit tougher for, for them. To see that again in them. I think, I think that was like the early 90s when you were probably four. When I was four? Yeah. Um, no, it was in it was in the eighties. In the eighties? Yeah. In the late eighty oh, nine. Late eighties, yeah. 80. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like in the, the late eighties. Yeah. It, imagine the, the that time, how medicine has progressed. Oh yeah. And people have have changed a lot since then too. Yeah, I think now I think now we're definitely trying to 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 not stigmatize it as much. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, I definitely think there still is a stigma. Yeah. But I think people are doing a better job um, at being accepting and um, really understanding that, you know, it is something that some people just can't control. Like, mm-hmm. it's not something that somebody did wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, as opposed to back then. Back then, a lot of people didn't accept it they didn't believe it they Mm -hmm. thought it was um attention attention seeker attention seeking Mm -hmm. um whatever reasons are maybe drug induced whatever reasons they wanted to believe yeah um but i think now it's definitely there's so many different resources out there like you know to to learn about it and then also to you know to to help people that are struggling 
Yeah. Mm. I think as a child, did you ever think that was your, like something that you did? Because children, I mean, as you know, my friend, you know that I have struggled emotionally, Mm -hmm. mentally, and I have seen it in my own daughter. Sometimes she would, she takes it really personal. Yeah. And those, those moments of anger or just crying or it, it just, yes, there are, there are called episodes. Yeah. Which I'm really (laughs) thankful. I haven't had one in a long time, but it's very scary for a child. And one of the reasons why I invited you here is that I hope that when my daughter's old enough, she'll be able to understand and also be able to help many others. But I, I know I, I've seen that in my own daughter's life, how she's have been scared of me, how she doesn't trust me at times. And I have to, and I would get angry. <laughs> it's like, like I get angry, like, trust me, I'm okay. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, the child can't. Yeah, yet. yeah. I I think um. For sure, as a kid, I didn't understand. Obviously, <clears throat> so as a child, you know, I didn't understand everything going on. Um. And there was so many times that I was angry at that parent, mm-hmm. who was sick because I didn't understand, mm-hmm. and I. I just thought I felt abandoned. Mm-hmm. And I remember feeling so bad for my other parent who was dealing with it. Mm-hmm. Like, they don't deserve the things you're saying, mm-hmm. the things you're doing. Because honestly, none of, none of the episodes were ever, like, directed at us as children. Oh. They weren't. Um, they're all directed at their that my other parent. Yeah. And that was hard for me to see because my other parent, like, stood by my... Um, my parent who was struggling Mm -hmm. with the mental illness, no matter what, like they were going to be there. And when that parent was gone in the hospital, all these times or, Mm -hmm. um, they were there taking care of me and my siblings. They were there getting up, getting us ready, taking us to school, taking uh, and still going to work, coming home, feeding us. Like, so there was so many times I was angry at my parent who was sick, mm-hmm. not understanding, you know, that they really couldn't control it or, you know, the struggles that the struggles that they were dealing with. And then mm-hmm. there was also a lot of times I remember on the lows. I always remember as a, as a child, I remember being like, man, they are always tired. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now we know why. <laughs> <laughs> I do. But a lot of it was like depression and they just they just wanted to sleep the day away. Mm-hmm. and it was safer I think yeah probably probably instead of deal, like being up and dealing with the emotions of three children mm-hmm. and you know not wanting to snap at them it was probably safer for mm-hmm. them to be sleep or to just go lay down yeah. and sleep the day away but you know I remember thinking like man they are always tired not realizing it was their depression just wanting to keep them in bed Mm -hmm. Um, or their low moments wanting to keep them in bed. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, as a child, you know, because as a little child, you know, I just remember being scared, not knowing what was going on. Mm -hmm. Why is this happening? And then as I grew older, grew, grew older, you know, I got, there was like anger you know, like at that, at that parent, like why? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, as I got even older and started understanding more things, then there was that more of that, that empathy or even that as an adult, Mm -hmm. it, that empathy turned to like, um, 
like appreciation or like I'm trying to think of the word. Was it like a pure love? Like admiration. Admiration, like through all that 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 parent had to suffer with, like they still made, they still gave us an amazing childhood. And they, they still like, they worked and they, they, they still managed to accomplish so much. They raised us in an amazing neighborhood. Like they, my parents together, I just have so much admiration because one did it through mental illness mm. and through this through the the stigmatisms mm. and still managed to like live an amazing accomplished life mm. and then one where most people would have just been like dude I'm done mm-hmm. um stuck by them mm-hmm. and through all that hard time like through all the stuff that they went through and they you know, so my admiration for both of them is like on a whole nother level. Yeah, they committed. Yeah, they took their vows very seriously. Yeah. and you know, they, despite like what the world might tell you is gonna happen or what you should be as a you know mentally ill person or with the diagnosis such mm-hmm. as bipolar, um, they both like just fought through, mm-hmm. and my admiration for that is is beyond like anything I could describe really especially now being being a mom of three myself Mm -hmm. like seeing how hard it can be like as a working parent without a mental illness Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) I can't imagine like you know what it would be like dealing with the extra stresses of all that Mm -hmm. I, I just can't imagine so my admiration now and you know my change of like scared to to angry to empathy to admiration has been is is that it it is why I want you know why I'm I want to talk to people about it and it's why you know it directed my career path and it directed you know things that I chose to do in my career path um because of that like it made you very compassionate because you are a very compassionate person. Thank you're you. tough like heck, but wish <laughs> 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 always wish he has to be, guys. Yes, but you're very compassionate. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I um, and and y- maybe it is because of my experiences, and uh, but I I feel like you know. You have to be. You have. You have to be understanding and empathetic and compassionate to everybody's situation because ultimately, nobody knew really that that was going on in our life. They didn't know what we were going through, and you know, you don't know what other people are going through. Mm-mm. So that's the best thing you could be for somebody is just compassionate and understanding. So, can we <clears throat> talk a little bit to the <clears throat> reli- uh, the church community? To yeah. the religious folks, all yeah. religion, yeah, <laughs> not only Christianity, but uh-huh. that's that must have been a little bit tricky and hard as well, right? Because they didn't know, but when they did, or they, yeah, how was that like? Our, well, I grew up in a very um, small, like a smaller church where everybody kind of knew everybody, mm-hmm. and. Um, we basically were like family. So um, my parent was actually very involved in the church too, and they actually were a worship leader um, for 13 years. And so thankfully, our church and our church family um, were very supportive and both physically and like spiritually because they not only like, were there physically, like to, to like take us to give us rides and kids rides take and stuff like that, and take us to school or whatever else we needed done, or even just a babysitters. Um, they were also there spiritually and like praying and constantly like praying over our family and 
you know, praying about this, the situation and, and, you know, that's another reason why, like, I, I, you know, I choose to, to raise my kids in the church because, because mm-hmm. I, because it was a big part of my upbringing and it, it was, a, and I seen the support and I seen the prayers and the intercession and, and how it did affect our family in a, in a positive way. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so, so to me, it's important to have that for my family and for my children. And, um, so, so the church family, the church in general, um, is important to, to, to me and to our, and to my journey. Mm-hmm. So when your parent finally was diagnosed and they decided to take medication, how was that challenge with their faith? I think, I mean, so my parent was diagnosed at an early age. They were only 17 years old. Oh, so, th- so your parent knew for a while then? Yeah, yeah. And from 17 until probably like 30, they struggled on and off with, I'm going to take my medication. I'm not going to take my medication. I'm going to take my medication. I'm not going to take my medication, which, which led to these cycles of episodes and hospitalizations. And not until they were about 30 um, did, they, did they finally come to the, the determination, like, okay, th- this is it. Like, I, I, I understand that I need the medication to live a, sta- live a stable life, although they didn't want to believe that, you know, for the 12 years that they had already been diagnosed. They, they, they finally came to, like, a breaking point, like, I don't want to be away from my family anymore. I don't want to do this cycle of, mm-hmm. you know, having a breakdown and being taken to the hospital by the police. Um, and that's when they decided to take to, to take the medication. So, but I think that, and the whole, like, pretty much from the age of, like, 20 to 30, um, they were very involved in the church. And, and... I don't, I don't think, because they were very private about it at first, Mm -hmm. um, until we kind of had to tell people because of our situation and needing help and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, so they didn't really, they, they didn't really like, they were never told like, don't take medication, um, just pray Mm -hmm. because they didn't really tell anybody, Mm -hmm. um, and then when it did come to the point of like hospitalizations, I think at that point when, you know, the pastors were brought in and people in the church family were brought into the situation, they kind of understand the severity of the situation mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. they were like, you know, you got to do what you got to do. Yeah. You know, we're going to pray for you. But if the doctors are saying take the medication, then, you know, we believe doctors and, you know, medic- medicine, there's there's plenty of um, examples in the Bible of different remedies that are used as medicine and medicine is referred to. Mm -hmm. So they, they never discouraged that parent from taking medication. Wow. But, you know, also they didn't, you know, put it above, above like prayers and God and, and, and God, you know, they understand that medicine is in addition to, to God's, you know, Mm -hmm. to, to prayer and to, to believe in God for healing and, you know, all that. So you, you guys were really blessed. We were blessed. I mean, that's amazing. Yeah. I, I would say more came from the family who were the. Her, it, it. Yeah. Like, the. I mean, it's amazing to see how the whole church community just surrounded you guys. I think a lot of people will get scared. Yeah. Because it or they wouldn't know what to say. Yeah. What to do. Mm-hmm. I think. um I think still now, like sometimes people, sometimes people might discourage medicine or medication and, you know, mm-hmm. preach just like no prayer, prayer, or, um, you need to, you know, pray about it or whatever, have more but faith. have more faith. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
But I think, you know, maybe the, that person mm-hmm. <laughs> who's saying that may have may not know somebody Never personally lived it, yeah. or lived it to understand the realness mm-hmm. of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I th- I think also like saying that you need something makes you feel weak at a moment. Like, oh man, I don't got it together. I really need medication. Really? I need I need something. Mm-hmm. But once you're on it, it just changes a lot of things. Yeah. And I think that was the, my parents' biggest struggle is that and also my siblings, it's not wanting to believe that, you know, you have to take medication to function, to function or be stable or whatever the, the word, you know, you want to use. But that's the biggest struggle, I think. Mm-hmm. And, and I even see it in my in my my work, you know, people. Um, people. I, so I'm in law enforcement and. I deal with a lot of um, offenders who are mentally ill Mm -hmm. and a lot of them will get stable when they're on their medication and they're doing good and they get a job and then they just like, they don't want to have to rely on medication. So they stop medication and then they start like going back, going downhill. And then some of them ultimately will like then try to um, self medicate. Mm-hmm. Using other forms of, you know, mm-hmm. drugs or alcohol or whatever it is they want to use. But um, then they ultimately, you know, go on this downward spiral. Mm-hmm. And so I see it like every day, you know, that whole not wanting to to come to the realization that, you know, they have to rely on a, a pill. Mm-hmm. That you need help. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So growing up, that has made the women that you are, my friend, very much so from your career Mm -hmm. to the hubby Mm -hmm. to the mom that you are. Yeah, I would say definitely made me the person I am today. Um, Definitely um, in all aspects of my life, it's it's determined you know, my career path, it's determined my, um, the way I treat people on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. It's, it's determined my strength. I feel like it's kind of made me kind of have to have a tough exterior. Mm -hmm. Um, Definitely, definitely something that Sometimes I don't realize that it had a, a, like that much of effect on me, but then when I talk about it or like relive it, mm-hmm. you you know, it comes back, mm-hmm. and you I get that emotional, emotional stuff going on inside. Mm-hmm. But yeah, if you can, if you can go back to that moment, any moment. Like from you were four, ten. Mm-hmm. Like just freeze that moment and say something to that, to that, to that parent, or to yourself. What would you tell that little girl, young lady, wherever you want to go? Yeah. I don't know. I think I would just. I think I would tell my parent that it's okay. Mm-hmm. Like it's okay that I would tell them it's not their fault mm-hmm. and it's okay. It's okay to see a therapist. It's okay to take medication that they're not looked at any less. Mm -hmm. Um, That's what I would tell the parent. And what I would tell myself. Mm -hmm. I'd probably just tell myself, like, 
like it's gonna be okay mm-hmm. because not knowing was always like the hardest thing you know mm-hmm. not knowing what was next not knowing if they were gonna come home not knowing what tomorrow was gonna hold mm-hmm. um it was scary but knowing that we came out of it I would tell them tell myself like it's gonna be okay mm-hmm. you have good parents and thankfully we have God on our side mm-hmm. and a lot of people praying for us mm-hmm. and my parents praying for themselves mm-hmm. and to just have faith you felt hopeful when you, when your parents started putting implementing everything that she knew she I mean yeah. the person needed to do yeah I mean once it um once we got through you know several years or whatever without any episodes or breakdowns we started feeling like wow it's gonna we're it's gonna be okay we're gonna be normal you know like and you start building that trust again like I, th- I think you said that um yeah you worried about your daughter trusting you or like she doesn't trust you because of whatever yeah you do you start building that trust again and in, in, in realizing like like they're okay mm-hmm. like th- it's okay and so you start feeling more at home and at peace and 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 hopeful mm-hmm. that it's going to be okay and so you know for us unfortunately that that feeling was followed by a sibling mm-hmm. uh, being diagnosed and then having to deal with the ups and downs of that. But um, having a parent that was present and that was capable and um, accomplished despite the, the, despite the mental illness mm-hmm. um, made feeling safe and safe mm-hmm. made that made it okay. You know, made it made that going through that situation better because if I had only one parent or one parent sick too on mm-hmm. top of that, it would have been it would have been tough. So, yeah, like there was complete healing, not only mentally, but also emotions were healed. There was restoration in, in the family. For sure, and I um, like I said, I. We, we did have a good childhood growing up, and, like, in between the episodes, like, all I have is good memories. Mm-hmm. Um, but we did, we, I feel like our family is so close because of our experiences and because of what we went through together mm-hmm. that it made us, it made us so, so much closer. It made us so much it, we just it we do we do we feel whole you know we feel mm-hmm. we feel complete we don't feel like we missed out our in, on anything or that we have like dysfunction or anything like that we definitely feel restored we feel like you know I I, I feel I'm I'm super proud of my family because yeah. I'm proud of my parents you know they they're married for over f- four decades mm-hmm. and then you know my siblings as well like despite my sibling struggling with all this you know they've been married for over a decade themselves and are a good parent and so you know I just feel I feel I feel like there's so much there's hope for people mm-hmm. there's hope for people and there's there's they can do and be something and despite you know whatever diagnosis they might have Mm -hmm. and so and I feel like my family is a testament to that yes they are yeah yes sir the reason why other I can relate to your parent and I see you and it brings a lot of hope and also that when other people come and see challenges or if even in my own family, I I I hope that I can um, can say, well, if mom did it, I can do it too. Yeah, 
you know the areas. And is there anything else, my friend, you would want to share? Or what about if you want to share to that daughter or son listening that weren't as lucky or as blessed as you were that mental illness did tear apart their family or and really hurt them? I mean, I feel like it it hurt me too, for sure. It hurt my siblings and it hurt, you know, my nieces and nephews that are now having to deal with it with their parent. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would just say don't let the hurt keep you from keep you from the the outcome, you know, don't let the hurt keep you from a from a good outcome. Mm-hmm. Just because there was hurt doesn't mean there can't be change or transformation or restoration. Mm-hmm. And just because your change, restoration or transformation hasn't happened yet mm-hmm. doesn't mean that it's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. And um, I would just say use use your experience to to help others. Mm-hmm. Right. Use your experience to encourage others because yes, maybe you 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 didn't have the same outcome as as I did and but because you didn't have the same outcome doesn't mean that you can't use your experience for good as well. Mm-hmm. Because there's other people that your story your story and your situation might help as well. Um, And I would just say never stop believing that there can't be a change because, you know, it can happen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some people probably didn't have faith in my parent that they would ever change. Mm -hmm. Um, And it it took 12 years for that person to finally, for my parent to finally to come to the, the, the hard decision in the line where they were going to to be determined and focused. And, you know, 12 years is a long time to live, to live with somebody like that and, and to live that life of constant. So for some people, they would have probably already gave up. But, mm-hmm. you know, maybe for, for other people, it might take one episode. It, it scares the hell out of them and they're <laughs> never going to do it oh, again, yeah. you know? Yeah. But some people, it might take, you know, just like drug addiction, you know, sometimes mm-hmm. it takes... A, a drug addict seven times in, in rehab, rehab. Um, to finally, you know, to finally make that decision. Sometimes it takes more. Sometimes mm-hmm. it takes less. But every person is different. Every person's situation is different. And I would just say don't stop believing because it hasn't happened yet. Mm-hmm. Um, and 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 it and if if your situation ended in a in a different in a in a drastic way. Where you know there, th- I would just say, all you can do is is use your experience for positive change in others, mm-hmm. um, whatever way that might be. I mean, never did I think I was going to be on a podcast talking about <laughs> my childhood <Yeah. laughs> to give yeah. anybody else hope, but here I am. Yeah. Um, I really didn't expect to be or or realize when I chose my career path that my experiences would be so valid and relevant to helping the clients that I deal with. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just think, you know, maybe not the greatest things happened in other people's experience, but great things can happen from that experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then I'll end. you shared um, something really beautiful one time we were walking. Yes. And I was... I think I was barely coming. I think I was my first month of recovery. Was it after the the conference? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah, it was after the conference. Mm -hmm. I barely had one month of starting uh, recovery. and, and, And that's one of the... I was praying a lot about that what you read. So I remember you reading it to me and bawling. Mm-hmm. 
because it, um, I felt so much shame, you know, how can I be a mom, a Christian, uh, Mexicana <laughs> <laughs> and deal with this. And I felt so shameful and, and uh, big time in denial thinking, how can I, how am I going to do this? How am I going to face this? You know? Mm -hmm. And when you read that to me, it was, and it still is. It's like, um, my version of serenity, serenity prayer. <laughs> it is, it is a, a way because I, I know how that is. I, I've been on the other side and now that I, I'm, I'm going through more inner healing as I continue my recovery, I can see those little glimpse in my bio, in my bio mom. Mm -hmm. I was like, Oh God, I don't know much about my bio dad, but I was like, Oh man. So I can see some things, but I am hopeful that our children won't go through that. Yeah. And, and I know we are, um, stubborn enough mm -hmm. saying that <laughs> it will not cross no, from here. It's, it's going to stop right here. It's done. It's done. And, um, so friend, would you want to share how, where, where did that, those thoughts come from? Okay. So in my department, um, we have what's called peer support and peer support is something where, um, you as a, a coworker um, can help other coworkers going through emotional traumas mm -hmm. or um, or stresses in their life. So, part of that to be a peer supporter, which is it, which is what I am in my department, um, we go through a training, and in that training, we have to be vulnerable about something that we ourselves went through, and so we're asked to like write down, you know. A, a story or a situation or whatever, <clears throat> um, just to kind of give everybody, all the other peer supporters, like, just so that way we could be vulnerable and understand, like, how it's going to feel when all the, when other people are coming to us with their problems and their stresses and their emotional traumas that they've dealt with, so they know how, so we could know the vulnerability it is into sharing experiences. So that's that's why I wrote this initially. Um, are you ready? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Let me drink a, a sip of water first. It's just water, people. <laughs> <laughs> it is just water. It's just water. <clears throat> and my voice is naturally raspy, mm -hmm. so. We <clears throat> sexy, I have to say. <laughs> I don't know about that. Yes, but it is. All right. <clears throat> mental illness there's ups there's downs there are dark times but ultimately there can be more days full of light if you know someone who suffers from mental illness it can sometimes feel like you are on a roller coaster you never wanted to ride on top of dealing with sadness anger and confusion surrounded surrounding breakdowns and hospitalizations you're forced to keep the pain bottled up inside because talking about it is taboo. There has always been shame in admitting someone you love struggles with a chemical imbalance. You felt like you can't complain about being the person dealing with a family member with mental illness and instead only be grateful you aren't the one suffering from it. <coughs> Diagnosis, Diagnosis often comes with denial. Then there's the cycle of not wanting to believe that you need to rely on medications to live a normal life, leading to missing doses, missing doses leading to another breakdown or hospitalization. The vicious cycle over and over until that person is strong enough to admit it's okay. It is okay. Instead of having a breakdown, they have a breakthrough and realize this is their new normal. N this is their new normal. And it's okay. It's okay to talk to a therapist and to take medications because doctors and medicines are divine blessings from God. And when this revelation comes is when your victory story begins. When the world wants to make them feel like you can't be productive because they struggle with mental illness, don't let that hold, 
let you down. Instead, you persevered. You were there. You, you were resilient. You took your meds and you prayed. Lots of prayers. You lived a normal life. And you accomplished more than most do without a diagnosis. My life gave, gave me great empathy, not sympathy, for those who deal with mental illness, which happens to be a great tool for the career path I chose. I understand not everyone had the same experience as me, and not everyone will be as empathetic, but understand that mental illness has no color or economical boundaries, and there is probably someone in your close proximity dealing with the hidden shame of suffering from mental illness, whether it's themselves suffering or someone they love. Show compassion to those around you because you never know what someone is dealing with. And if it's you and you've held it in, to, in, held it in for so long, reach out to talk to someone. Understand you are not alone. And then I finished at the time with saying, and if you're my friend, I'm always here to talk or simply just listen and pray. And sometimes that's the best thing you could do is just listen and pray. Mm -hmm. It might not be anything that you can do, but... I think that's the best thing you can do for someone, just to listen. Yeah. Just being that person at that moment mm -hmm. just takes a moment. We don't need you to say anything. Yeah. You don't need advice. No. <laughs> I, we, we, we can pay someone for that. <laughs> we just want a friend. Yes. That's what people want. Yeah. Just a connection with another person. Well, speaking about friend, I have something for you. What? Yes. do my best I'm not really good reader i'm dyslexic guys so here it goes <laughs> here it goes my dearest ak rano ak all the goals all the time <laughs> i wish you could see you the way i see you for the moment i met you wow that sounds romantic <laughs> way back in the movie theater i admire you the epitome of a badass, the most compassionate, strong, loyal, talented, caring, hardworking, beautiful, and sweetie. You know I love you. Women I have ever met, women I have ever met, let alone have the absolute blessing of calling you my friend. You inspire me to be more, to believe in me and for more, to do more, to give more, to be there for people more, to show up, to laugh harder, to love harder, and to cry like no one's watching. <laughs> <laughs> You're not extra, my friend. You are more, more than I could ask or imagine. You are a gift. The life you live, the love you give to me, your friends, your family, our church, people, is a, is a glimpse of Jesus. You are a light. The best friend anyone could have. And I am so freaking grateful, sincerely humble, to call you mine. Love you. That's from your friend, Brenda. <laughs> That's what your friend Brenda. And as a friend, are you doing this? And as a mother who's coming out of the other side, I want to say thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for doing this. It's it's hard to share our story, but I wish I had somebody when I was little hearing this and I wish I had somebody a few months ago hearing this so that's why thank you for giving hope to our community to protecting us for giving hope in our church in our friendships thank you thank you and we honor your parents for doing the right thing we honor them and we say thank you to both of them for sticking it out and for 
loving God above all things yes. and also loving each other and their family. Yes. So thank you, friend, for giving me hope today and giving all of our listeners around the world <laughs> some hope and encouragement that they too can live a good life. You're very welcome. And I just want to tell you, it's going to be okay. Your daughter's going to be going to be a strong, beautiful, resilient woman one day. And my admiration for my mom is going to be the admiration that she has for you. Thank you. <sighs> Amen. <laughs> <laughs> so, guys, I just want to encourage you to seek help, that it's okay. Please start talking about it. Please t share some share your story with somebody. Yes. If you need help, go look for professional help. Yes. If you need spiritual help, go look for spiritual help. If you need medication, there's there's help there. Please don't do this alone. It's it helps our community, it helps our families. And most importantly, as it helps you. So as I end this podcast, I just want to finish saying that remember that hope is for everyone. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Replenish Hope. If you want to get daily doses of hope, please subscribe and share the hope with others. And remember, hope is for everyone.